If you look at a calendar, every month is dedicated to something. Well, June happens to be Men's Health Month. I actually didn't know that. Maybe you didn't either. And when it comes to men's health, especially African-American men, prostate cancer is something we may hate to talk about, but something we have to talk about. And that's exactly what we're going to do with a doctor who's doing some revolutionary work in the field and a patient he helped to beat that disease. Dr. Michael Bivens, thank you so much for being on All Things Men. And for 18 years, you've been a member of the team of doctors at Urology Centers of Alabama. Plus, just this year, you were announced as president of Urology Centers of Alabama. Doctor, I could read forever. <laughs> you have all kinds of things. Let me ask you right off the bat, your definition, Define prostate cancer. Well, prostate cancer is um, is cancer of uh, the prostate gland, and the prostate gland is a gland that men have, and it's um, located within the genital tract. So it's located um, in the pelvis of a man, and it's located under the bladder, and it's that little organ that surrounds the urethra, and the urethra is the tube that that a man urinates out of, and so. Its function is a function of fertility. It allows transport of sperm to fertilize the egg. So it fertilizes women. If, if a man did not have a prostate, then he could not fertilize a woman. So that's the purpose of the prostate. That's where it's located. And it's when this gland turns into cancer that, that men, men have problems. Uh, let me ask you this. What are yeah. the symptoms of that kind of cancer? Well, that's a great question because, uh, <clears throat> you know, the typical symptoms, um, and, and particularly when, when the cancer is discovered early, is there are no symptoms. And so that's always the challenge when it comes to men, is that um, me trying to convince a man to, to get screened for this cancer, and they tell me, I don't have any symptoms. And that's when I go, that's when you need to be screened. You, you don't need to wait until you have symptoms. And what we've seen over the last 30 years is, you know, if you, if you go back to 1980s, early 90s, when this cancer would present more advanced, that's when men would have more symptoms. They would have blood in the urine, you know, difficulty urinating, pain, pain in the bones. And so after the early 90s, when the PSA came about, we started finding this cancer so early that men didn't have symptoms. So, you know, the typical cancer doesn't have any symptoms. And that's why it's important to get screened because it's important for us to go look for it if it, the cancer doesn't tell us it's there. We should not wait until there are symptoms. Uh, why is prostate cancer so prevalent in African-American men? Well, that's a million dollar question too. And you know, there are a lot of research going into that. I've been involved in some research projects, ongoing research projects that's trying to answer that question. The, the short answer is we really don't know the speculation is it's probably genetics. Um, is you know we think environment may play a small component, but we think genetics probably play a larger component. But we do know that African American men carry two times the risk of being of having cancer, and we also know that the cancer tend to be more aggressive, and and in African in, in African American men and African American men typically when they are actually diagnosed and treated they typically would have higher volumes of cancer. So this cancer does affect men, black men, uh, in the diagnosis, in the way, in the way it, um, it, it acts within black men, and, and it also kills black men at a higher degree. Let's talk about Robert Young Jr. He was referred to you, why? Yeah, yeah, so, you know, um, it, it, first of all, Rob's a great, Great guy. I want to. I want to put that out there on the airway. Rob does a lot to um, to educate men to get the word out. I mean, he and his wife, I feel they are very passionate. And I hope they don't mind me saying this, but yeah, you know, I, I owe them a lot just on their passion of of getting the word out. But yeah, you know, Rob was referred to me a long time ago, and in, in um, I don't know, it's been he can tell you better than I can. Uh, probably fifteen years ago. And, you know, typical setting, you know, he just kind of went into his doctor, got a blood work and, 
and he was doing normal, normal, no, no symptoms, didn't have any symptoms and trucking along, you know, and, and boom, he finds out that his PSA is elevated. And then, you know, at that point, we went through the whole process of diagnosing and, and treatment. Um, now is a good time to bring up an interest of yours, robotics. What is okay. it? Yeah. What is it? So, you know, I, I'm in that sweet spot where we used to, I, I got trained. So my, my background training is, is, um, is, pro, is, uh, is, is prostate cancer actually. So I did a fellowship in prostate cancer. So when I went through residency and my fellowship, we were doing all open procedures and we thought we were pretty good at it. We thought we had it down. And then, and then you know, early 2000s, the, ro the Da Vinci robot comes, around, comes along and it revolutionized this, this procedure. Um, anybody, anytime you operate in the pelvis of a man, it's like operating in a bowl. You can barely see, you can barely get your hands in, in, in certain places. It's a difficult surgery, just, just anatomically. And so the robot comes along and now we can see in places we couldn't see, we can get in areas we couldn't get into. It, it, it may surgical, surgically, you know, we could, we could do tedious surgery uh, with minim, minimum trauma to tissue. It just totally revolutionized pelvic surgery and in particular uh, prostate, pros robotic, I mean, excuse me, prostatectomies. And so um, we, it allows us to, you know, remove the prostate, minimal trauma to the uh, outside tissue, allows us to spare nerves for, to preserve male sexual function. It allows us to put tissue back together uh, again, uh, together it allows for us to get better um, continence. And what continence is, is allows us to, because most men, one of the complications is leaking after surgery. It allows that us to have that to occur at a lesser degree and faster recovery. It allows minimum pain because you're not making any big incisions. Men are able to, to get up and, you know, I have them, whereas in the past it took three to six months to get back to normal. Men are not back to normal probably in about two weeks, um, they're in a hospital one day, they are in three days, they keep their catheters in for, for you know two to three days. They're driving their cars, going to church in, in by the end of that week of their surgery. Um, so just the way that it has totally revolutionized the way we do surgery is, it has just been very, very impactful. And, and, you know, it allows us to, and, and I probably have done about 3,500 robotic prostatectomies. So I got a pretty good, you know, abundance of experience. And, um, and it, it just allows us to, to, to do this same surgery better than we've done it in the past. Doctor, I know my doctor's schedule. I know the pills I have to take. I know the pills I have to get. You're a doctor, but you go to a doctor. How okay. often do you go to your doctor and what's that like? Well, you know, uh, so I'm a black man and you know, I I didn't have a pediatrician growing up. I mean, I'm from the South. I didn't have a pediatrician growing up. So it wasn't a structured routine where, you know, we had regular scheduled visits. And, you know, I, I saw where, you know, uh, people around me started having heart attacks when I turned 40. And I really fear, probably even as a physician, drove me to the doctor. And so, you know, I, I typically will have an annual visit with my primary care physician. And, you know, it's always an interesting place when I have my primary care physician and we get to the point of, I, of my prostate exam and it's like, well, you know, you're the expert, but do you want me to do it? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you do it. I trust you. Um, uh, but, you know, I have to go and I have to, you know, do my yearly exams and, you know, go through the same regimen. Um, and, you know, we just got to encourage our people to to get out there and get and get these exams. We really need to start young people on getting there, you know, going to the pediatricians and, um, and getting those exams. And I think that carries forward. And, and, you know, I always say you know, the thing about some of us, in particular, African, in particular African-American men, you know, only, you know we, we're men. We, we carry a lot of weight and stress on our back. And we, we, like, we don't go to the doctor unless there's a problem, which is a horrible 
um, philosophy to have. You know, wait until the car, and, and I always tell men, you know, you wait till your car break down before you get it serviced, and, you know, <laughs> and so, you know, so I think we need to, to you know, kind of encourage our, our, young, our young people to go to pediatricians to get that mindset and um, it, it set early on. And, um, and then we need to start early as we can to start getting our, our yearly physicals, checking those things you talked about earlier, blood pressure, you know, sh- blood sugars, A1Cs. And then, you know, as an African-American man, start getting those prostate exams and the PSAs at 40, and then making sure that we go regularly on, you know, a year on a yearly basis to get all of that done. So I, I, I do those visits and I don't wait until I'm hurting or I'm bleeding or, you know, all, I can't sleep. Those are typical things that drive a, a man to the doctor's office. But again, to your point of breast cancer, women go, they're used to, they get in pelvic exams, the pap smears. It's just a routine thing that they get and they start early on and it's, it's just ingrained in them. And they'll do from the time they start their pap smears to the, to the day they die. They'll, they'll, they'll go to the, to the doctor. Whereas with us, we have to wait until we hurt him. Dr. Michael Bivens, you're the second Michael Bivens I've interviewed. Bell, Biv, DeVoe, and all that. How do you hear about that a, a lot? Oh yeah, I get that every I get that every day. Um, you know, I listen. I I met those guys once at a concert or after a concert um, at the uh, Essence Festival, and you know, great group of guys. We we talked and we met up, and you know, we all joked about my name, and you know, those they're they're a good group of guys. And uh, but yeah, you know, I thought it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dr. Bivens, thank you so much. You're you're doing a great thing. I thank you for that. You have a great day. All right. You have a great day now. See y'all later. Robert Young Jr. and your wonderful wife, to your right, my left, Althea, welcome to both of you. How you doing, Mark? Uh, Robert, you're a prostate cancer survivor, but You went to the doctor for a different reason. Tell that story. (laughs) Well, I should let my wife tell that story more. But what happened, I injured my shoulder uh, playing golf. And she got tired of me walking around with my head, you know, (laughs) I look like a, like a, like a whatever. So I went went to my doctor and explained the situation to him. And I have one of those doctors that every time I go, everything is pretty much a, a major checkup. So he did my blood work and everything else, and uh, my PSA numbers came up. I, that was in uh, September of 2004. So as a result, as a result of my PSA numbers coming up uh, high, they were in the six range, actually around the six. He sent me to, uh, to Dr. Bivens, who's a urologist, and they did the the PSA test, and by the way, both of them did do the digital test also. So they did that, and after after seeing those numbers and doing those results again, Dr. Bivens ordered a biopsy, and that came back in October uh, as positive for prostate cancer, and that's when that's when the journey began. <laughs> okay, we'll get to that in a second, but Althea, he mentioned uh, you should tell the story. How and why are you important to this story? Well, again, you know, trying to get your husband to go to the doctor sometimes isn't as easy as we would like for it to be. <laughs> and actually, this was the second time that he had kind of like a crook in his neck. Now, the crook has nothing to do with prostate cancer but it has everything to do about seeing about yourself. And so that second time that he, uh, you know, had this kind of crook in his neck, I was like, Robert, you really need to go back to the doctor and have him uh, look at your neck. Well, like Robert said, he ran uh, the extra test and found out, you know, that his PSA was high. So he did what I asked him to do and he is here today. Because if he had not, he probably wouldn't be here today or he would be very sick. It wasn't hard to get me to go that second time because it was interfering with my golf swing, so I had to go. 
<laughs> Robert, you have a great wife. I just want you to know that I'll uh, uh, ask both of you this question. Have either of you known someone who had prostate cancer? Uh, not prior to it, not prior to my diagnosis, but after I was diagnosed and gone and went through my treatment, there were some people that I knew that had actually been treated for prostate cancer before me. Uh, one of the problems we have in the black community is for with black men is that we don't talk about this. So, you know, you don't have a you don't have a resource to work with when you when you're diagnosed. It's, it's entirely different from uh, women and, and breast cancer, and that's an entirely different game. They tell everybody, <laughs> but but uh, black men with prostate cancer, that's a you know that that's like a hidden secret. Robert, um, you had gone to your doctor. Your PS PSA levels were up. Uh, right. um, he, uh, your doctor, uh, referred you to Doctor Bivens. Right. What happened after that? Well, what, what came after that is that after the diagnosis came through, like I say, they, they did a biopsy just to verify. And once uh, they did the biopsy, we started talking about the different forms of treatment, uh, whether, uh, whether I was going to have surgery or radiation or a couple of other uh, types of treatment. And But when it was all over, we looked at it and we decided that uh, you know, we wanted to go ahead and have the surgery just to go ahead and make sure the cancer was completely out. One of the things about radiation, a lot of people, a lot of people choose radiation treatment and you know, that's their choice. The one issue I have with that is that if, if you have a recurrence with the radiation, then uh, they, doctors do not want to go back in and do surgery. But if you have surgery and you have, have a recurrence, there's that there's their avenue for radiation that can come in and, and pick it up. But uh, the main thing you know, with that is, because like I, I had the surgery, I had the robotic surgery, and that's an overnight thing. And it's, just, and it's just amazing. And this... This was back in 2004, so they've improved the pro 2005, excuse me, and they've improved the process drastically since then. But you know, imagine you're going in for a cancer surgery at, at six o'clock on a Monday morning, and you're back um, at at your house at two o'clock Tuesday afternoon. Uh, he speaks so highly of you. Um, he also talked about how your mission in life seems to be, and not seems to be, is to tell people, uh, uh, to tell them about your experience and how they can do things to help avoid what you've been through. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, I, I, like, I, like I told you earlier, as we said earlier, black men don't talk about this, so they don't know have, have any attitude. Uh, go to go to when they're diagnosed. Even at my church, um, after we were diagnosed, after I was diagnosed, when my wife and I, and after I was treated, my wife and I told the church and and went before the church and told everybody what we went through. And since then, you know, when people are diagnosed, you know, they they pick up the phone and call me, or they'll come see her. They, they'll find both of us actually. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I I can say that since then. I've talked to several people who've come to me before, um, you know, or right after they got their diagnosis and asked. In fact, I had one guy who uh, who was diagnosed, and he told me, you know, he wanted to have, he, he went to Dr. Bivens also, and he said he wanted to have the same treatment I did. But uh, after he got there, uh, he and he was diagnosed at an earlier stage than I was, so. He ended up not having the surgery, but ended up having the radiation. But he's been doing fine ever since. But that was once again that was because of an early, early diagnosis. Now, what happens a lot of times is when they get when a lot of black men are diagnosed at a point where, as I said earlier, uh, the cancer has spread to the bone or it's gotten outside of the prostate area. It may not have actually gotten to the bone yet, but it's gotten outside of the prostate area. So they can't do the surgery at that point. So they have to look at other options, which are more, uh, which are a lot more intensive and not, and you know, just don't have the same, um, same rate of success.
my my thing to the men is to allow your spouse, your significant other, to be included in that process. That, that a lot of times, you know, we go to appointment and still today we may argue a little bit about what was really said because. We're both there and I hear certain things, he heard certain things. And so with, with the two of you together, then um, you can actually have success with your recovery. Well, th th those are great words, great advice. Althea, great advice. Robert, great advice. Althea and Robert Young, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. Many people have had their eyesight restored due to a now common procedure known as laser eye surgery. Those who have can thank Dr. Patricia E. Bath for inventing it. Dr. Bath was an ophthalmologist, an inventor, and a humanitarian. In 1981, she started developing a laser-based device for cataract surgery in 1986, the laser FACO probe was born. She got a patent for it in 1988. Now, before this technological advance, cataract removal required the manual grinding away of the cataract. Dr. Bath's invention improves the accuracy of the operation and reduces the pain a patient feels, and that's a good thing. Hospitals around the world still use the laser FACO probe. Patricia E. Bath was born November 4, 1942 in Harlem, New York and passed away May 30th, 2019 in San Francisco, California. Thank you, thank you everybody for tuning in. Remember, June is Men's Health Month. And if you didn't already know, I am a stroke survivor. If you are too, don't give up. There is life after stroke. I'll see you next time on All Things Men.